shout and touch the Lord as He passes by. You find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment your needs to supply. Reach out. Let's open our Bibles this morning to the book of Ephesians in the New Testament, Paul's epistle to the Ephesian church, chapter 3. Ephesians 3, God's mystery. God's mystery. How many of you enjoy a mystery? Do you like mysteries of whatever sort? Mm -hmm. And uh, I uh, enjoy a mystery and I'm sure you do as well. I enjoy a puzzle. I do crossword puzzles when I get home at night to kind of, kind of just de, to just kind of change gears, and uh, that's kind of a mystery as well to see things coming together. But uh, this is a different kind of mystery. We're going to be talking about the biblical mystery, which is something that was always there, but it was hidden, and then in God's timing, it's revealed. A truth that was always there. It was there in the Old Testament. But it's revealed in the New Testament. And the summary for chapter 3 might be, God reveals his mystery of the church as the body of Christ. Amen. That's the mystery. The Old Testament did talk about Gentiles being saved. But the mystery was that Gentiles and Jews would become one in the church of Jesus Christ. That was not revealed until it came forth from the apostles Peter, James, John, the prophets uh, who did foretell in the New Testament time. And uh, we see this coming together in the pen of Paul here. The Jews and Gentiles are to be one in the body of Christ. So with that in mind, uh, we're going to try to draw this lesson from today's chapter 3. We must receive, share, and pray for God's mystery, the church. And Kelly, would you open us in prayer? Yes. Gracious Father, thank you so much for this mystery. Lord, help us to understand these words from the Apostle Paul, and we ask that you would bless everything we hear, let it uh, go into our hearts, and help us to be changed by it. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen and amen. I find it helpful when getting into a chapter to go back to the previous chapter and get a few verses to see what we're talking about. So let's go back to Ephesians chapter 2. And I'm going to ask for Kelly to read verses 19 to 22 as a background for today's message. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord and whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So here Paul is talking to Gentiles as well as to Jews. Now the Gentiles were the ones who were uh, strangers and foreigners. They did not know the law of God. They didn't know the Torah. And so they were strangers and they were foreigners. But because of the blood of Christ, they have now become fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God with the, the Jews who have known the word of God. And they are being built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, the word that God gave them about the oneness of the church, Jew and Gentile, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. And in Christ, the whole building is being fit together. It's growing into the holy temple in the Lord, uh, to whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So it's the one building that intentionally is never finished. Every day there are new members joining the body of Christ. Peter talks about this as uh, living stones. Let's just uh, take a moment. You don't need to turn to it. But Peter, in his first epistle, talks about the fact of the analogy of a building that we're like stones being put into that body of Christ and Jesus is the one who is the chief cornerstone. Um, let's look at uh, 
First Peter chapter two, verse four. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So this building is growing, and as people come to Christ, uh, the building is becoming stronger and stronger, and you and I have a, a role in that. In fact, Peter goes on to say that while certainly God is sovereign, and he knows the day and the hour that he's coming, we can hasten that day by our sharing our faith, by bringing more into the body of Christ. Now, my Jewish wife had to remind me of something <laughs> I had forgotten about. Uh, this is a holiday, a high Jewish holiday. And uh, anybody know what it is by any chance? Did you uh, pick up on that? Uh, June 5 and 6, today is June 5. Uh, and uh, June 5 and 6 are uh, Shavuot. And uh, it's S-H-A-V-U-O-T in our English, Shavuot. And um, Shavuot is celebrating a couple of things. In the Bible, we know from the Old Testament that it's the, uh, the, the feast of the, uh, of the, the Pentecost, the 50 days, the, the festival of the wheat harvest, uh, waving that harvest thanksgiving to God, uh, known as Pentecost. Uh, to the uh, Jews, they observe that as the giving of the Torah, the law to Moses. So they are celebrating that tonight uh, and all day today. Uh, last night I was just, um, I had about 10 minutes to kill before bedtime, and so I uh, googled uh, webcam, Western Wall, to see if I might find a few folks there at the wall. There were a few. Uh, at 5.15 in the morning. And customarily there might be, I would number maybe 20 or 30 uh, there at the Western Wall. But I was shocked. I did the webcam, and it's called Earth Link, I think. And shoulder to shoulder, the whole area of the Western Wall, men and women's side, were people standing with their white shawls. There, must, there were thousands, thousands there. I said, What's going on, Kelly? And she said, this is Shavuot. They're celebrating the giving of the law. And there they were. They were davening back and forth with the law. They were giving that. And it was very, very inspiring. They honor the giving of the word, the first five books of the Bible, uh, and honor God's giving that to Moses. And I thought about them, and I said, you know, this is a perfect timing for us. Because tomorrow, for us, the 5th of June, we're talking about the body of Christ, the church. And the birth of the church was on this very day of Pentecost. So really, the Jews are celebrating the feast of the, uh, of the, of the Pentecost, and they are celebrating the giving of the law. We in the church are celebrating the birth of the church. Acts chapter 2. And so this becomes a very, very important day. In fact, this is one of the three most important feast days for the Jews. Passover, 50 days later, Pentecost, Shavuot, and then finally in the fall, Tabernacles. And so here we find the birth of the church, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues, as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so here is the birth of the church. So this is a very important day. This is, and so the Jews are standing shoulder to shoulder thanking God for the law. You and I are standing shoulder to shoulder thanking God for the birth of the church. One thing more we have to do. We've got to pray for them to come together. Jews and Gentiles to come to Christ. The vast majority of Jews have reverence for the law, but they do not know to whom the law points for salvation. We need to pray for our brothers and sisters to become brothers and sisters in Christ. So do pray for the Jews. This is a day for remembrance of the law, 
but the law always pointed to the Messiah. And so let's pray that they will come to know the law. Um, incidentally, we just did a little research on that. My Hebrew is as bad as Kelly's, but um, mm -mm. It, um, we, we wanted to find out, how do you greet somebody on this day of, uh, of Shavuot? Uh, the, the, the Hebrew would be Chag Sameach, and that means happy holiday. And so if you see a Jewish person today, say Chag from the throat, Sameach. And enough of that. He's that's good, isn't he? Not, not really. That's being raised <laughs> in a Jewish household. Uh, <coughs> that's not all I could do. I couldn't even learn that much. But, um, uh, and I want to just say, and I'll make just a quick reference to that. This mm -hmm. chapter three is of ex personal importance to me, one of the most important chapters in the Bible, because it talks about Jew and Gentile coming together. As most of you know, I was uh, raised by an Orthodox Jew. My stepfather, Mordecai Ben Sadia Zeitlin, known to you as Pastor Mort Lynn. And uh, he raised me from the, I was adopted when I was eight, and I was adopted into his household. I was believed by the community to be Jewish, still am by, by many who don't know that I pastor. But um, raised in the Jewish household, to see this Orthodox Jew uh, turn from the hypocrisy of what he perceived to be in the, uh, uh, the keeping of the law in a hypocritical fashion, became an atheist, and eventually became a born-again Christian and became a co-pastor in this church. So in our family, personally, we were able to see Jew and Gentile become one, which is the subject of this chapter. So personally, I love, I love this chapter as I do the whole Bible. But let's begin now. Let's talk about this mystery and how it's been revealed that Jews and Gentiles are to be one in Christ. And uh, let's talk, first of all, about the revelation of the mystery verses 1 to 7 of Ephesians chapter 3. Kelly's going to read the seven verses and then we'll talk about it. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, <coughs> you may understand <coughs> my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. <clears throat> so here we see the... Um we see the mystery revealed, the mystery that God always intended for Jews and Gentiles to become one in Christ, the body of Christ, the church. Verse 1, for this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles. He's referring to the fact that he is in prison in Rome for sharing the gospel with the Gentiles, inflaming the anger of the Jews to the point of his being imprisoned when he was in Jerusalem and then sent to Rome to testify before Caesar. And so I'm in jail for you Gentiles because I dared to preach the gospel to you and made the Jews angry. And that's why I'm here in prison. If indeed, verse 2, you have heard of that dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. The dispensation uh, is a $5 word, which really, it means the stewardship. I had the responsibility, by God's grace, to share the good news with you. Paul was given by God a responsibility to share the gospel. Does that sound familiar in our lives? You and I have that responsibility as well. Maybe not the way Paul did, but just the way God does in your life through social media, and through going to the gas station, wherever. It's so easy now to talk about the Lord. Talk about the Lord in whatever way comes to your heart. And so I had that responsibility to share that gospel. You and I have that same responsibility. Verse 3, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So he revealed to me this wonderful mystery of the oneness of Jews and Gentiles in the church. And so God is not completely satisfied with things today. He sees so many Jews and Gentiles here who are not saved, not in this room, but here in this country and around the world. Um, 
incidentally, the United States probably still is the most spiritual of the uh, countries we know about. COVID uh, did have a powerful impact on the faith of about 30% of those interviewed in a recent poll. I think it was a Gallup poll. About 30% said that COVID increased their faith. Sadly, 70% had no increase or effect from that. But this was far more than other countries that didn't have any real spiritual impact from COVID. And then I see those several thousand who were there by the wall, honey, and they are just davening and they're honoring the word and only God knows their hearts. But I pray that they're going to come to know Jesus and be part of the church because uh, it's great to have the shawl. I used to have that and the yarmulke and I used to have the, uh, the tassels and all of that. Uh, and even tried davening and <laughs> all of that. Uh, did not know Jesus. And so many of these dear folks, they, they know the law, but they don't know Jesus. Uh, and Paul talks about in Corinthians because there is a, a veil over their eyes. Pray that veil is removed, that they can see Jesus. Well, verse 5, this long sentence of Paul goes on to say, this mystery which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men. David didn't know it. Jeremiah didn't know it. Isaiah didn't know it. And boy, who knew more about the future than Isaiah? But he did not really see the oneness of Jews and Gentiles in the church. And as it has now been revealed by the Holy Spirit to his apostles and prophets. Who revealed it? The Holy Spirit. Who's the revelator? The Holy Spirit. Who's the one who teaches us all things? The Holy Spirit. Who's the one you should go to when you have a problem with your computer with your toilet not uh, flushing properly, for your car not working properly, go to the Holy Spirit. Wisdom, Holy Spirit. Teach me. And more importantly, teach me more about Jesus. I think I know more about Jesus than the guy around the corner. Ha, ha, ha. Forgive me for my pride. Yeah. Lord, teach me more. Teach me more. And I know that you're a healer, and my brother in Christ doesn't believe you're a healer. Reveal to him your truth. And then, Lord, you've revealed to him things that you haven't revealed to me. Tell me, Lord, all about Jesus. Tell me about Jesus. Well, he goes on to say in verse 6 that the Gentiles, here it is, should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. There's your summary of the whole chapter right there, verse 6. The mystery is, it was always hidden, until the Holy Spirit revealed to the apostles and the prophets that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. So Gentiles, welcome to the family of God. And Jews, please, wherever you are, give your heart to Jesus and be part of that body. We think about the promises made to uh, Abraham and those promises were not just for the Jews, the Jewish believers, but also for Gentile believers. And so you and I are fellow heirs of that promise, of the greatest of all promises, and that is of the Messiah. Well, Paul says regarding that, of which I became a minister, according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. So God gave me this truth, and therefore, it made me a minister. When God gives you the revelation of Jesus Christ as Messiah, it's not just for yourself. When you're born again, you're not going to embark upon the three S's, sit, soak, and sour. <laughs> no, you're going to go out and serve. Serve and share with others the good news. If there was a bargain basement sale on Macy's down the street, and it was 90% off. I would be there. You'd be there, I'd be here alone. But chances are, on the way, you would also text everybody you could and say, oh, sure. there's great news, there's a sale at Macy's. Well, this is even better news, that there's salvation through Jesus Christ. So I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God. It wasn't something I manufactured, something I did. In fact, elsewhere, he says, I really had no choice. I deserve no credit. I was forced to by the, by the Lord. And so he gave that to me. And that ministry is by the effective working of his power. I love that phrase. The grace of God, God's undeserved favor, was upon me. And it was done by the effective 
working of his power. Uh, if you do the research in the Greek on those, um, and incidentally, it's not hard to do research today. Just, just type in the, on the internet, you know, Ephesians 3, verse 7, uh, Strong's Concordance, and they'll give you the actual words in the Greek. It's not as complicated as when I was going through seminary before computer time. It's so easy now. What is effective working? Effective working is the word energeia. We get our word what from that? Energeia? Energy. It's the energy. It's the superhuman power. The energy of his power. And the word power is the word dunamis. In the Greek, we get what words from that? Dunamis? Dynamite. Dynamite. Dynamic. That's the power of God. I don't want to have to go out and share my faith because I'm, I'm not very articulate or I haven't got a lot of scriptures or I'm shy. Let the Lord do that. He, know, he made you. So you're shy. Well, he knows how to use your shyness. He knows how to use your fear. He knows how to use your whatever to just let you be you. And then you share. And you're going to find somehow that someone's going to just say something and you're going to blurt out God's word and you're going to be used by his power. So the, the mystery of sharing the good news, this mystery of Christ, has been given to you as well as to Paul, and it's by the effective working of his power. You've got incredible power to share the faith and to live the faith. And incidentally, this idea of sharing the faith is not just talking it. As important and maybe more important is living it by your life as well as your lips. So Lord, help me to live the gospel. Kelly is involved with um, uh, a number of Jewish, uh, Orthodox Jewish people uh, and rabbis through uh, your, uh, your websites, through uh, medical pursuits and what have you. And uh, these, these folks, uh, in, a, in a few cases, they, observe, they watch us here. They're, they, because of Kelly's contact with them about uh, medicine and, and the virus and all that sort of thing, uh, they, they've come to invite her to some of their high level uh, and also their uh, orthodox prayer meetings. And um, in turn, they have uh, shown the courtesy of visiting us online as well. So she said, as you're talking to about the Jews, talk to the Jews. So if you're watching us, we love you. We pray for you. We ask you to pray for us as well. And uh, that we may all may be one in Christ. In any event, um, whatever method God uses, he wants us to be praying for this oneness that we need. So that's the revelation. It was revealed. It was, um, and then Paul's been distributing it, and you and I are to distribute it. What's the purpose of the mystery? Let's look at verses 8 through 13, and Kelly's going to read that. What, what is the purpose of this mystery? To me, whom am, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him, Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. So what is that purpose of this mystery of God, the mystery of Jews and Gentiles being one in Christ? Uh, he says um, it needs to be shared with men, verses 8 and 9. To me, Paul writes, who am less than the least of all the saints. That's a very humble attitude, isn't it? Humility will go far. Arrogance doesn't go very far at all. I mentioned a recent survey of uh, people in the business community, not necessarily Christians, but people in business, asking what was the most important quality for the head of their business, the CEO or the president or chairman of the board. What's the number one quality you would want in the organization that you are part of? And the word they chose was humility. I want for the leader of our organization to be humble. Not necessarily the smartest, or the wealthiest, or the strongest, or the most ruthless, but humble. And so if you want to do a good work for the Lord, I'm the least. But 
I like two scriptures that put the whole balance together. I am the least of all the saints reminds me of John 15, 5. Jesus said, you know, you're the branches and I'm the vine and apart from me you can do nothing. But then balance that out with the Philippians 4.13 written by Paul. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Without you, Lord, I'm nothing. With you, I can do anything. There's your balance. So to me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Oh, I like that. The unsearchable, you cannot possibly fathom all the riches of Christ. The word riches there is the word plutos, and it means wealth, and it means abundance of possessions. So the next time somebody says, do you believe in a prosperity doctrine? They probably mean about those that get on the internet and try to just get your money. But if it means the wealth and prosperity that we have in Jesus Christ, I think we all believe in the prosperity doctrine in that sense, because our Lord is able to meet all of our needs. And as far as the financial needs, and boy, things are getting tight financially, we know that. We know that scripture that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and my mother Verna used to say, oh, and by the way, he owns all the minerals under the hills yeah. as well. Oh, I like <laughs> the that. The gold, the silver, and what have you. He can easily sell a cow, or he can mine a little bit of gold to meet your needs. You, you or you can it. take a chicken and make three meals. That's true, too. That's I'm right. Cooking I'm cooking one today. Oh, that's good. And uh, so we... You, you take care of your tithing. I was thinking about insurance. You know, when you have insurance and the, something happens that's bad, you're covered. When you tithe and you bring your 10% into the house of God, that's your insurance. And you are going to be covered by the Lord. Whether you keep your job, you lose your job, whatever, he will take care of it. Well, I'm less than all the least, but God has given me this grace to preach to you Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see... What is the fellowship of the mystery? What is that stewardship, that responsibility that you and I have as well to share that good news? Which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Christ Jesus. So it was always hidden in God about Jews and Gentiles being joined together. And God created all things through Jesus Christ. He was the agent of creation. Colossians tells us the same thing, again written by Paul, that Jesus becomes uh, the end of all being. Uh, he's the agent through whom we are uh, finding our lives being changed and all things being created. Um, let's see here. Let's just pick up uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. So he is the uh, agent of creation. He is the... Energy and the, cre and the conduit of creation. He's the goal of creation. Everything is for him. That simplifies life. We spend so much time trying to say, what's life all about? It's all Alfie. about him. Alfie. Yeah, what's it all about, Alfie, as the old movie uh, was, and a song too, I think. But what's it all about? Why am I here? What's the purpose of it? It's all about Jesus. It's all about serving him. And so Paul goes on to say here that... Um, and in verse 10, he created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent that now the manifold or many faceted wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Now that's surprising. We've been talking about sharing the good news with others, Jews and Gentiles, human beings. But as you and I are sharing the good news with Gentiles and Jews, human beings, when we're speaking from the pulpit, we're speaking at the laundromat, we're speaking over FaceTime, you're not just speaking to them. You are speaking to principalities and powers in the heavenly places. 
principalities and powers are angelic and demonic beings. They are different levels of angels and fallen angels, kind of like general, colonel, major, captain, lieutenant, what have you. They're different levels, the good guys and the bad guys. They are all listening to the gospel. There are a number of scriptures that indicate right now there are angels, referring to the good guys, in this room. They're observing the women and they're chaste and humble contact. They're fascinated by the gospel because while they know it, they've never known it by experience. They know it intellectually, but the good guys have never fallen. Are the bad guys here too? Oh yes, the demon spirits are here as well, and they're hearing the gospel. And so when you and I are proclaiming the truth, who really knows? Who cares? I talked to that individual, that person gave me a kind of a deaf ear, didn't want to hear it. Well, first of all, that might sink into that person's consciousness later on. But also there were a host of angels and demon spirits who were also hearing the gospel, the gospel that Jesus Christ is able to save sinners, sinners who have turned from God, that through the love and the cleansing blood of Jesus, Jews and Gentiles can come to Christ. The gospel is being preached all over, all the time, by you and by me, to human beings, but also to angelic and demonic beings as well. So to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God, his wisdom in saving all of us, would be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, and it's all according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's all about Jesus. It's all accomplished in and through him, in whom, in Christ, we have boldness, and access with confidence through faith in him. So we have this boldness and this access to go right before the throne of grace. We all know about the little tabernacle in the wilderness, the little image of heaven on earth, later on the temple. We know about the little back room with the Ark of the Covenant representing the throne of God, and that veil that separated the holy place from that little back room, the most holy place. Tradition tells us that veil in the time that Jesus died was 18 inches thick. But Matthew tells us that when Jesus died, that veil was ripped from top to bottom. Talk about nice material. Yeah, from top to bottom. Access was granted by the death of Jesus Christ. Before that, the Jews would have to uh, send the high priest back into that room he had to have the blood of a, of a goat Send us. to sprinkle it on the uh, article of furniture, on the Ark of the Covenant. And leave the string so you could he could pull the body a, back that's out. That's right. He had a rope <laughs> attached to his, his right ankle, with, and he had bells on the bottom of his garment. And uh, they, they couldn't go back there or they'd be struck dead. And so on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, the most holy day for the Jews, the priest would go back in there, sprinkle the blood and, and, uh, and uh, the sacrifice and Ask God to cover the sins for another year until Christ would come and remove them. And as long as the bells were being rung, he was fine. He was ministering back there. But if the bells would stop, that meant that God had killed him and there'd be no forgiveness. They'd have to then take that rope and just pull him out. Because he had to be pure. So if there was any, anything in him... He had to make, his purity was through the sacrifice right. that he, of that goat. That's access. That's very limited access. One person, one day a year. And what are the poor Jews today doing for their access? How do they do that? What do they do? They try to be kind. They try to be decent. But what is the sacrifice that God requires today? It's still the same as it was from the day that Jesus died, the blood of the Lamb. And so we now have access, not just on the Day of Atonement, <coughs> not just through a high priest. You don't need to go to a priest to have access or a rabbi or a pastor. You just go directly to Jesus, to the throne of God, to the Father, anytime you want. Talk about access. And it's all because of Christ. Verse 12, in whom we have boldness, not cockiness, humility, but absolute assurance. Boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. I always reminded of the picture, it's probably on the internet, I haven't seen it in a long time. When I was younger, and some of you were not even alive, but the president was John F. Kennedy. 
and he had a son named John John, who sadly is no longer here. And uh, little John John was just a little toddler, and he was on the floor in front of the big uh, president's desk. The president was behind the desk doing work, and there's John John with his toys right in front of the desk. And uh, he knew he was in daddy's presence. I doubt that he knew then that he was in the most uh, important office probably in the world. Uh, but he had boldness and confidence that he was allowed in that room. Now, if I had walked into that room, <laughs> Secret Service would have been all over me and hogtied me and sent me on out, maybe in jail. But I, I didn't have access. But that little boy did because he was family. He was the son of the president. You and I have that kind of access before God 24 7. Let's use it. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you. So don't worry about me. I'm in prison here, but I'm here for your sake, and I'm here for the gospel. And you can be proud of that fact that uh, you're worth it, that I would go through this. And my tribulations are your glory. Thank you, Paul. So when you get up to heaven and you meet mom and dad, if they're, if they're saved, and, and you see Jesus and what have you, Get in line. It's going to take a while probably, but shake the hand of Paul. If you're a Gentile, he's your daddy, spiritually speaking. He's the one. He, Timothy, Silas, uh, Titus, these are the fellows who brought the gospel to the Gentiles. And if you're Jewish, you thank Peter and, and Paul also and James and John for sharing that good news. Finally, the appreciation of the, uh, the mystery. Let's read verses 14 to 21. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with a might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church, by Christ Jesus, to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. That is a powerful, powerful prayer, followed by a powerful powerful doxology. It doesn't get any better than that in all of the Bible. Verse 14, for this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. He is truly Father and Lord, and uh, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus himself is Lord of all. Well, this is the prayer that Paul has. And notice the depth and the richness of it, verse 16, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Look at that. Just break that down in verse 16. He's praying, and I can pray this for my wife. You can pray for someone else as well. And Lord, I'm going to pray and learn how to pray scripture. Just apply it to yourself and to others. I'm going to say, Father, please, I'm asking you, according to the riches of your glory, that my wife Kelly will be strengthened with might, there's that dunamis, through your Holy Spirit in the inner man, Amen. in her inner being, your inner core. May she be strengthened by you, Lord, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Lord, may Jesus Christ dwell, be comfortable, settled, permanently residing in the heart of my wife through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, rooted and grounded in love, using that agricultural term there, you know, good strong roots, good strong earth, mm -hmm. grounded in love, may you be able to understand with all the saints the fullness of God's love, the width, the length, the depth, the height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Is that a rich it's prayer? It's a mystery. Is that a wonderful rich prayer? 
And so, Lord, we pray for those several thousand people we saw davening before the Western Wall, earnestly, just said, together like sardines. There was not even space between them. And they were there, and they were honoring the law that you gave. We pray, Lord, for those people over there and all over the world, Jews and Gentiles, that they're going to be strengthened with might through your Holy Spirit in their inner man, and that Jesus Christ is going to dwell in their hearts through faith that they receive him. And that they'll be rooted and grounded in your love. That they able to, they can comprehend the, the width and the length and the depth and the height of your love. And that they will know the love of Christ which passes all knowledge. And that they'll be filled with the fullness of God. That's our prayer for them. And that, that's the kind of prayer that Paul prayed. That's a powerful prayer. And then here's this doxology. One of the most beautiful ones in the Bible. Read verses 20 and 21, honey, will you? Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Doxology is a, is a hymn of praise to God. Now to him who is able, look at the power of God, to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. He has so many superlatives there. So can someone be healed? Oh, absolutely. He's able to do exceedingly. The word exceedingly is the Greek word hooper. It means over, beyond, more than. Beyond what we think. It's exceedingly abundantly. And the word abundantly Perisos is beyond measure. It's extraordinary. It's exceeding. And then above is the, the word hooper again. He uses the word twice in the same sentence. He says here he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. And it's according to that, what's that word? Power. power. It's dunamis. That power that works in us. The word works there is energeo. It's, it's energy. It's moving in us. It's, it's living. It's powerful. And it's a powerful, powerful thing. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Notice how all the glory is towards God. That's a powerful prayer. You can ask for your prayer requests like being strengthened with the inner man, but always end with praise to him. To, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Mystery solved. Jews, Gentiles, you're all welcome. Come to Christ. All are be welcome. Be part of the family of God. All are welcome. In the Kel, kingdom. you want to close us in prayer, honey? Amen. Father, we thank you so much for the word today that we were able to hear and, and learn. We ask that you would bless all those who would listen. And that, Lord, you bring each person closer to you. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen and amen. He's passing by this moment Your needs to supply Reach out